Michael Medved, it's wonderful to see you and to talk about your Thank great you. new book, Ten Lies About America. Somebody called you the worst person in the world. <laughs> Who was that and why? Well, I'm honored to say that uh, Keith Oberman nominated me, and, and I think the proper pronunciation, at least based upon the Keith Oberman show on MSNBC, is the worst person <laughs> in the world! <laughs> so that's the full distinction. And what bothered me about that designation was he used a photoshopped uh, picture of me. And uh, the actual picture, I was uh, holding a little bobblehead doll of my friend Hugh Hewitt, who's uh, my fellow radio talk show host. And they actually photoshopped it and put in that I was holding a little statue, a little bust of Robert E. Lee. Oh, for heaven's sake. And the claim was that uh, I was an apologist for slavery and that I was somebody who said that slavery was a good thing. And, uh -huh, uh -huh. and, and of course, I, I, I never said that. You're, uh, you're not an advocate of slavery? <laughs> no, thank goodness I am not. <laughs> you can, I give you the opportunity to set the record straight. Right, not in the United States <clears throat> and not in Saudi Arabia, where, by the way, it's still practiced, and not in Mauritania, where it's still practiced today. It was outlawed in 62, was it? In exactly. Saudi Arabia? Mm -hmm. Officially outlawed. Officially. 1962, no. not 18. That's, that's right. <laughs> a, a little bit late. Look, what, one of my ten big lies about America that I write about in the book, in fact, the second one in the book, is the lie that says that the United States was uniquely guilty for the crime of slavery and that we based our prosperity on the stolen labor of African slaves. Now, mm -hmm. The word uniquely is important here. No reasonable person, certainly not me in my book, would deny that the United States bears a measure of guilt for this horrible institution that mm -hmm. has no defense. Mm -hmm. However, the reality is that at the time that the first slaves arrived here in Jamestown in 1619, slavery existed in every corner of the world. There wasn't one speck of land or culture or society where slavery didn't exist. Mm -hmm. The United States had no role in establishing the institution of slavery, and yet we had a very major role in abolishing it. So the idea of a special guilt in the, on, uh, for the United States and special moves toward reparations, I was struck in the book, the, the House of Representatives of the United States, this year, in 2008, uh, passed legislation apologizing for slavery, and that's fine. I mean, uh, uh, to finally get an apology on the record. However, the resolution that was passed said the United States practiced slavery as it had never before been practiced in human history, mm -hmm. buying and selling people like animals. All historians of slavery will tell you that that is 20,000 years old. Right. That's the nature of what slavery was. Right. And you mention also, I think, in the book that the word Slav um, is a is a version of the word slave, right? It, it is. I, slavery was so, because the Romans used Slavic slaves, I mean, people from the Slavic countries as slaves, mm -hmm. so, so prodigiously. I, I, the, the majority of the citizens of ancient Athens, which we think of as a great and more beautiful society, were in fact slaves. Right. So, so this idea, it's, it's a big problem for, for the United States. I was just struck recently, the Intercollegiate Studies Institute did this survey, <laughs> which about uh, basic civic basic civics knowledge. I took the quiz, and I bet you did very well. I did all right. And I'm sure you got like a hundred <laughs> or even. The, the, what was striking about it was the typical American got a failing grade of mm -hmm. 49, mm -hmm. and that our elected officials did even worse. Yes, exactly. When they, when they, how, and they, college professors only got 55 percent right. Right. And, but part of the reason they get so little right is because th the basic facts about slavery, for instance, remain unknown. Mm -hmm. One other position, that, that, that bit of information, I think is very important, and I was stunned when I found this, and this is not an item that is in doubt, no historian disputes this, all the leading African American historians will stipulate that this is the truth, is that of the 20 to 22 million Africans who were kidnapped from their homes and who either died in the Middle Passage or actually arrived at their destination. Of that 22 million people, it's a huge number, 3% maximum were destined for the future United States. Right. In other and words, it's a tiny if, part of It of isn't the total. as if this country is proud of its slave owning uh, past, and it isn't as if this country hasn't suffered greatly to eliminate it um, and to wipe out every uh, vestige of it. And uh, we gave 600,000 lives in the Civil War to extirpate slavery. Um, and uh, we have 
you know, had now generations of affirmative action and so on to attempt to remedy the vestiges of it and so on. But um, we are coming up on Thanksgiving. And uh, another of the lies that you address in your book concerns uh, our relations with Native Americans. Right. And, and, and again, no one is saying here that um, the leaders of the United States were blameless in, in regards to dealing with what used to be called the Indians. Mm -hmm. uh, no one is saying that, uh, that Indian civilization flourished after contact uh, with Europeans. But the charge of genocide, right, which that is specifically, the charge. specific, it's, it's, it's completely bogus and there's no basis for it. Mm -hmm. Because genocide has a meaning. It has a dictionary meaning. It has a legal meaning according to uh, the Geneva Conventions and to mm -hmm. UN treaties. Genocide involves the deliberate extirpation of populations, deliberately eliminating one entire population of people. Mm -hmm. There was nothing deliberate about most of the death involving Native Americans. 95% of the death, and by the way, this again is universally accepted. This is not controversial. Right. 95% of all death, at least, was through disease. Right. And the charge that there, what's so bizarre Those to me. Those smallpox blankets. Right, but see, the charge of smallpox blankets and of germ warfare, Th th that is supposed to have taken place at a time when people didn't understand germs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, this is a time mm -hmm. when physicians, for instance, didn't, didn't wash, wash their hands right. because they didn't know. So they but you tracked down the, the only two examples, right? And you, right. you studied those. So, so tell us what, what you found about there are only two examples where mm -hmm. there's a historical record of smallpox attempting to be uh, spread by but whites against Indians, right? And, and there's no evidence that, that it, it was. That there are two examples okay. that are cited, and they're cited yeah. misleadingly. Mm -hmm. and, and one of them involved uh, the French and Indian War, and uh, well, actually an episode in Pontiac, what's called Pontiac's Rebellion, mm -hmm. uh, where Lord Jeffrey Amherst, in postscripts to letters that he had with a Colonel Bouquet, said, wouldn't it be a good thing if, um, if, if uh, so somehow these savages could be eliminated. At one point they say we should hunt them down like dogs. And then at another point they say, well, we will we'll give them some of the rags and blankets that are infected with the pox. And it, uh, there's no evidence that they actually did that. Mm -hmm. And there was no record. And they had very good records at the time mm -hmm. of smallpox epidemics. Mm -hmm. But in this particular episode, there was no smallpox epidemic that, that hurt the Indians. What hurt the Indians was that they ended up losing the war after this siege was relieved. And then the other in, in, involved um, <coughs> early, earlier on in the history of the United States in the upper Missouri River, where the, the evidence is very clear, and there are journals and there are army investigations. There was an attempt by the U.S. Army to protect the Indians. They had a ship that had come up that was fur trading, where the, the people, the, the white people on the ship, the European-American people, mm -hmm had been infected with smallpox. And by that time, they understood how smallpox was transmitted and contracted. Right. And there was an attempt to prevent contact with the Indians so that they wouldn't get the disease. And the Indians insisted they wanted the goods and they wanted the trading. And there was some infect, but it was not a major smallpox devastation of the Mandan population at the time. And it wasn't intentional. And it certainly wasn't intentional. The U.S. Army, and this is the point, it's, it's stunning, because I go through in the Ten Big Lies about America, <coughs> all of the major Indian massacres that, that, that people hear about, Wounded Knee, Washita Creek, Sand Creek Massacre, the Pequot um, so Massacre at Mystic Fort in 1637. And in every single one of these instances, without exception, they're, they're battles, they're fights. Mm -hmm. Now, they tended to be one-sided, right. like Little Bighorn was one-sided in the other direction. Right. But there were casualties on both sides. And part of, part of what this was was brutal warfare mm -hmm. between a Stone Age societies and, and advanced European societies that may not have been advanced spiritually and they may not have been advanced. However, however, the results of all of this, the, the question that I ask, and I, I'd ask this question for anyone, uh, what, what if, if, if you had, as, as P.J. O'Rourke said, if you had Bono and Jimmy Carter and Mother Teresa designing policy toward Native Americans, what should it have been? Mm -hmm. Or, or sh do you, are you one of those people who believes that it was a horrible thing that Europeans ever came to, to, to the New World? 
In which case you have to rewrite all of human history, right? Because it's always the story of populations moving around the planet and uh, meeting up with one another and clashing and sometimes cooperating and sometimes not. But uh, we can't rewrite all of human history, can we? Well, and it's also the biggest event of the last 500 years. And this is, uh, there, there's a, a historian who I admire very much, named Walter McDougall, who makes this point. The biggest event in all of human history of the last 500 years, without any question, is the emergence of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. if you look at what this world would have been like in 1500 or 1508, uh, yeah, it was Spain's a country, Britain's a country, France is a country, Russia's a rising power, China's a big empire. What's different? What's different is America and its impact on the world. Right. And the important thing for me, particularly in this holiday season, is that we recognize that that huge development, the rise of the United States, which has changed everything for the whole world, right. was a positive development. Right. It, it, not, not, not a pure, uh, uh, sinless, right. or, or guilt-free, but however, on balance, right. hugely positive for all of humanity. Yes, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> you also are at pains to discuss in the book that the United States was founded as a Christian nation, explicitly so. Why is it important for people to understand that history correctly, that we were not, uh, that the founders were not secularists and didn't intend a secular country? Well, it's important because right now there are people who do want a secular country and are very busily engaged in going around the landscape and ripping off crosses here and ripping off Ten Commandment monuments here. Interestingly, many of which were set up to promote a movie in 1956, the Cecil B. DeMille Ten Commandments, and, uh, and, and basically to get rid of little references. I mean, we had in California, there was this huge fight over the Los Angeles city seal, which had been there for 100 years. And the city seal had a tiny little cross in, in, in one corner to recognize the fact that it was originally founded as Los Angeles, the yeah. Angels. No, we have to change the name, don't we? That's, well, that's unconstitutional well, to call San, it San Francisco the city of is the going Angels. to be in trouble. There are a lot of, lot of places <laughs> that are going to be in trouble. San Diego, St. Louis, forget mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. um, in any event, the, the, the point of, of all of this, the reason it's important to understand what the founders intended is because, and you saw this in this election, Mona, there was so much fear of, quote, the Christian right. Mm -hmm. uh, people are trying to impose theocracy. The people who are trying to change America fundamentally from what our founders intended and what America has always been, which is a deeply religious nation, Tocqueville wrote about this. Everyone who's ever visited America says, well, yeah, do people really go to church? They really take the religion pretty seriously in that place. We always have. Right. And, and the people who are trying to change this country are not religious conservatives. They are secular militants who want to create something that never existed and was never envisioned by our founding fathers. A couple of examples that you give in the book, you talk about the fact that the original states had uh, established churches. They did. and Six they, of them? Yes, exactly right. And, and, and they continued uh, in New Hampshire up through the 1840s where there were requirements for voting. You had to believe in Jesus Christ to vote. Now, I don't think that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. and, and well, as not in New Hampshire. They repealed it, right? Exactly. Yes. But the, the point being that the First mm. Amendment, when it says Congress shall make no law respecting establishment of religion, and you know this as an attorney, that, that the, the law was written, the First Amendment was written and phrased that way to make sure that there was no federal religion which would take precedent of over the state religions which already existed and was to keep religion away as a federal matter. But the idea that government should be disentangled from religion, I, I make the point in the book, the 24 hours after adopting the First Amendment, that first Congress of the United States adopted a deeply religious resolution of thanksgiving, thanking God Almighty for his manifest blessings and for preserving our country and declaring a national day of fasting and prayer. So they clearly had a very different idea of separation from what the ACLU might advance. Now, in your book, you talk about multiculturalism. Um, and I'd like for, you, for our viewers, for you to distinguish between a society that has lots of different cultural influences and multiculturalism. Can you, can you tease that out? Oh, certainly, because it's, it's very important. One of the big lies about America, 
um, that, that I write about is the lie that says, we've always been a multicultural nation and in diversity is our strength. We've never been a multicultural nation. We've always been a nation where people came from many different cultures. But it's interesting. I went back and looked at Hector Saint-Jean Saint de Gravecoeur, who, who was obviously not of English ancestry. He was French. And apparently he spoke with a thick accent. But he, he wrote uh, this classic American text uh, between the time of the Revolution and the time of the Constitutional Convention called Letters from an American Farmer, we said, what is this American, this new man? And he says, it's someone who, coming from all these different places, throws off his old culture and embraces something new. And, and that's also the term, the melting pot. I mean, I was fascinated, I didn't know this. The term melting pot was made popular by a play in 1905, which was a huge hit on Broadway, called The Melting Pot, which was written by a British Jew named Israel Zangwill. And the whole idea of melting pot is a term of metallurgy, not cooking. Yeah. It's not, oh, we're going to put in a little bit and we'll hey, taste the paprika over mm -hmm. here, and over here we'll taste the cream, and uh -huh. over here we'll taste... No, metallurgically you blend things so that the metals aren't recognizable they anymore. They come out different. They come out different and stronger. Mm -hmm. And that has always been the American ideal. Certainly, uh, African Americans have, have made tremendous contributions to American culture. American culture is inconceivable right. without black music and, right. and, and, and black dance and black cultural tropes, all of that. However, it's part of our national mainstream. Mm -hmm. It's not separate. And this desire to separate different cultures, why would we want to go the way of Belgium? Or Canada. Well, talk about Belgium and Canada. What's, what, are the, what are their problems? <laughs> well, well, Belgium is this artificial country that was set up not long after ours in 1815, and they have never reconciled the division between Flemings and Walloons. And it's because they speak different languages, they right? They speak different languages, and they have different religions and different cultures. America's, America's always been a nation with with very similar religious outlook which where the overwhelming majority has been christian mm -hmm. some some Catholic but always Christians. made room for jews mm -hmm. right and, from the very beginning right right however never never really denying the fact that the prevailing culture of the place was biblical and right and and the point being that also english has always been very important in this country we had a substantial proportion of the pre-revolutionary immigration to, to the future United States was German. Mm -hmm. um, most people don't know this, but the biggest <coughs> ethnic group in America by a, by a pretty big margin of advantage is German Americans. We have 57 million people in this country of predominantly German ancestry. A lot of people started to try to hide that during, during World, World War I, I and, and then of course World War II. But the, the truth is that what the, the cost of Americanization was learning English, and maybe having some pride in your home country and the mother country and the homeland, but recognizing that my prime identity now is I am this new man, this American. There were uh, any number of World War II movies, right, where there was always, it was a cliche, you know, that the unit had a Jew from Brooklyn and an Italian from somewhere else, from right. Boston, and, a, and an right, Irish guy, and an Irish a farm guy, boy and, from Iowa. And they all managed to get along and be cohesive, and they were all Americans first. But you know what? It's not just a cliché, and it's not just a fantasy. That, that's what our country has been. And again, if you look north of the border, um, Canada is a very interesting example, by the way, which relates to another one of the big lies, which, uh, which is the idea of American imperialism. People think we're such an imperialist, <coughs> such an aggressive, land-hungry country. How come we haven't taken possession of Canada? I mean, there's lots of land, lots of resources. It's cold up there. <laughs> and, and, and by the way, we did try early in our history, we did. But, but failed. But the, the, the point being that the Canadians, the Quebec, they still have agitation to this day. There have been, within our lifetime, there have been two or three occasions where Canada's almost split apart. Exactly right. And, and we don't want that for the United States of America, which is why the whole ideal of multiculturalism is a, is a new and bad idea based on one of the ten big lies about but America. But is it just multiculturalism? Is it just the idea that we want to maintain our separate identities ethnically and religiously? Or is it an assault on the ideas of America itself? Uh, it's a, I believe it's an assault on the ideas of America itself because what it's saying is that there is no such thing as an American identity. Well, mm -hmm. there's an, uh, a, a British American identity and an Irish American identity. And by the way, 
and a gay identity, and you know, the, they they want to slice the, the the categories very thin, don't they? They they do indeed, and and that of course is always a mistake because if the melting pot analogy has any force at all, it has to be uh, dissolving these previous alloys into into this this new strong, durable metal called an American. Now, on a related point, are we on the verge of becoming a majority-minority country? <laughs> no. Uh, and, and again, this is so based, it's based on statistical manipulation. The, the, what all this is based on is this idea that, that the designation Hispanic is mm -hmm. somehow a racial designation, mm -hmm. which now 48% of all Hispanics describe themselves as white. Mm -hmm. and, and there are people like Cameron Diaz, I use the example, who's right. blonde and blue-eyed and right. Cuban-American. And uh, Martin Sheen is a Me Mexican-American. His real name is Estevez, as people know. Um, but these, these are not people who are racially different. The notion that the Hispanic identity is different from an Italian-American identity because it won't melt is being contradicted every day by the, the very high rates of intermarriage. intermarriage. Mm -hmm. and, and again, and, and all of this What is, is the rate of intermarriage for um, uh, Hispanic uh, Americans? At least 30% mm -hmm. of, of all Latinos marry Anglos. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's high intermarriage with, with um, uh, African Americans, Latinos. And Asians and Latinos have very high rates. So some people are suggest that today among Chinese Americans, which is the largest of the Asian American groups, mm -hmm. Among Chinese Americans, the intermarriage rate is over 50 percent. And, mm -hmm. and uh, again, someone, uh, some might say, well, in the old days, the Ku Klux Klan people would say, oh, this is racial admixture. This yes. is the mongrelization of America. We've always been about that. And by the way, one of the points about genocide against Native Americans, more Native Americans were lost to Native American identity by far through intermarriage than through massacres. You mentioned in the book, just to go, uh, tease that out a little bit more, you mentioned that many more people have recently begun to identify themselves as Native American because it's become more fashionable to do so, yeah, right? Bill Clinton, who announced that he uh, yes, was Cherokee. Yes, yeah. well, leaving him aside. <laughs> <laughs> there are some who really are, like... Um, well, he might be, too. He might be. Um, but name some of the famous Ta Americans Tommy who... Tommy Lee Jones, James Earl Jones. Uh, see, Cherokees held slaves, and they had a lot of slaves. They had about 30,000 slaves at one point. And the slaves of the former Cherokee Nation, especially since they went out to Oklahoma and Cherokee Strip and Phillips Petroleum, which is a Cherokee company. See, all of these people, all that, all that needs to happen is a small Indian tribe gets a casino. Like the Foxwoods Band, uh, this is the l world's largest casino in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. and the Foxwoods Band, I think, is 1,500 people. So, of course, all of these people are saying, well, I'm 116th Foxwoods and I deserve a right... So part of it is money, part of it is fashionable, but Cher is very famously mm -hmm, Native mm -hmm, American. Mm -hmm. uh, Reese Witherspoon, I believe. They're, they're also, you, you have all kinds of great examples in the book of how you know, these neat little categories don't fit the history. I mean, if you, for example, you, you cite the fact that um, 50,000 black Americans uh, fought for the Confederacy in the Civil War? E exactly. If you go to meetings of sons of the Confederacy or daughters of the Confederacy, uh, just as you will with daughters of the American Revolution, you'll find African American people. And 10% of uh, George Washington's army was African American? A absolutely. I, I, now, I, were those free blacks or slaves? Or no, a mixture? Uh, no, at the time they were almost entirely free, free blacks. And, and again, at the time of the Civil War, uh, there were about 400,000, quote, freed Negroes, they were called at the time. Mm -hmm. And most of them, of course, were overwhelmingly on the Union side, but right. there were some who were on the Confederate side and who were themselves slave owners. Now, what would you do with that if you were going to find people to give reparations to? Well, that I, makes it complicated, doesn't it? Well, I, the, the point that I make is the <laughs> Obama family is unbelievably complicated because President-elect Obama uh, has zero ancestry that was ever enslaved because True. his the black part of his family was in Kenya and they never made it over here. They were never enslaved. He, on his mother's side, the Dunham side, there were slave owners. So would Barack Obama then, because his mother was the great, great granddaughter of slave owners, would he then have to pay reparations to his own children <laughs> who are descended half from Michelle's family where presumably th th there was a slave background? It, it, it just goes to the Perfect lunacy. Perfect example. 
And by the way, this is something else on this issue of multiculturalism in the Ten Big Lies about America. I couldn't believe this when, you, when I found it. The majority of African American population today, it's a bare majority, about 51 or 52 percent, is people whose ancestors were never slaves in the United States. They're immigrants to this country from either Africa, like Obama's father, mm -hmm. or, or from the West Indies, like Colin Powell and his family. Right. People who may have been enslaved in some place, right. but, but not in the United States of America, which also makes this whole reparations concept ludicrous. Right, right, right. Interesting. Um, all right. Well, we're going to turn now to the 20th century and uh, the power of big business. <laughs> you, uh, you attack this frontally. Um, you're not taking sides, uh, you, one, of, one of the lies that you list, remind me of how you phrased it, big business is bad for America or something along those lines. How, yeah, how did you phrase it? It's just that the, the rise of big business oh. oppressed ordinary people. Okay. And, and again, it's, it's ridiculous that people actually believe this big lie, given the fact that ev everything we do and enjoy in this country depends upon big business. Does it have to be big? There's no way that you can build a car in a garage and, mm -hmm. and sell it competitively. Mm -hmm. This coffee that I've been sipping on here, it's going to be really hard to have a small business that actually goes down to Central America or out to Africa, somewhere where they grow coffee, harvest the beans, uh, goes ahead and grinds up the beans and, and brews the coffee. And it, it, Basically, uh, current civilization and technology requires a certain amount of size. And, and Mona... This is one of the things that I was stunned about uh, uh, in, in researching the book, is that you will find in polling data, people in the United States are incredibly positive about small business. About 80% of Americans have a positive attitude towards small business. But when you ask them about big business, it's flipped. About 80% have a negative attitude. Every single small business wants to get big. Right. Every big business was at one point a small business. When we say we like small business, but we don't like big business, what we're saying is we like businesses that aren't that successful. <laughs> <laughs> Which we don't. I mean, look, and, and, and the truth of the matter is the pen that you're wearing, other that you're holding in your hand, the, uh, the, the clothing that we're, we're both wearing, uh, all of this in a, in a post-industrial age, the computers that we use, the computers that I use to write this book, um, it, it is all dependent upon this miracle of economic combinations that, by the way, also relate to, to one of the other lies in the book. And this is a lie that a lot of conservatives believe. And it bothers me a lot, the notion that there's a war on the middle class. Uh, middle class life in America has improved and, God willing, will continue to improve. Well, we'll get to that after we take a short break. Afterwards and several other C-SPAN programs are available for download as podcasts. Visit booktv.org. More with Michael Medved and Mona Charon in just a moment. A national icon and a family home. This is where we really live. Down the hall is the part of the White House where the president and his family live. This house is only on loan to its tenants. I never forget that I live in a house owned by all the American people. Seven nights inside America's most famous home. White House Week, only on C-SPAN. Afterwards, with Michael Medved and Mona Charon, continues. Now... Big lie number six is that government programs offer the only remedy for poverty. You recall in the book that when you were growing up, you had a fairly conventional view about what the Great Depression had been and about what FDR's role had been. Describe for us what that conventional view is. Oh, well, sure. I, I, uh, my grandparents were immigrants. All my grandparents were immigrants. And uh, my mom came over from Germany in 1934. And my parents grew up. Um, hugely admiring, worshipping almost Franklin Roosevelt, partially because my dad's parents, my grandfather was a barrel maker and they had a home in South Philadelphia. And I remember very vividly the one picture they had in their living room was a picture in sepia and black of FDR, 
that had been made available right after his death in 1945. And they had it in a little dime store frame. And I remember as a kid, they had a little crack in the glass. But you couldn't say a word against Franklin Roosevelt because he was the one who had saved the world and gotten us out of the Depression. And one of the things that, that is stunning today is you'll see this with covers of magazines showing that Barack Obama wants to be FDR. Why would anyone want to be FDR? The truth is that all those New Deal programs uh, quadrupled federal spending as a percentage of our gross domestic product, hugely grew government, built these whole new massive bureaucracies, and did nothing to lower unemployment or to cure the Great Depression. And I mean nothing. And what was striking to me here, Mona, was this is not just conservative doubters or revisionists mm -hmm. making the point. I, I went back and looked at, at my old college textbook from the 60s, which was actually written by Arthur Schlesinger, who had been an aide to John Kennedy and was a huge admirer of Franklin Roosevelt. And, and one of the points that Schlesinger made was that the, the Depression, the recession of 1938, five years into the New Deal, mm -hmm. after the spending of billions of dollars and the hiring of millions and millions of new bureaucrats, that the recession of 1938 was in many ways more savage and more painful and more deadly to the American economy than anything that had happened before. David Kennedy, who later became president of Stanford University, great historian of the uh, Great Depression, and a big liberal, said uh, the New Deal was many things, but something it, it wasn't was a recovery program. And, yes, and, I have and, that. And, and, and I think that we, we need to, to keep that in mind. What, what got us out of the Great Depression was we had 16 million men, including my father-in-law and my father, who were uh, placed in the armed services and enlisted or were drafted in World War II, and that, that cures unemployment in a hurry. The, um, <clears throat> there are those who say that the New Deal, far from ending the Great Depression, prolonged and deepened it. Are you in that camp? Absolutely. There, I don't think there's any question, but it's not just the New Deal. You see, one of the, the, the big lies that again, I, I'm astonished that more people are unaware of is the lie that Hoover did nothing. Right. I wish that Hoover had done nothing. If Hoover had done nothing starting in 1929, the, we probably would have been coming out of the economic downturn. On that time subject, let me office. interrupt you and just ask you to talk a little bit about how um, Harding handled uh, the recession. You talk about that in the book, Harding and Coolidge. Yeah. Well, Harding, Harding was elected in 1920, biggest landslide in American history, by the way. And, and Harding and Coolidge came in, and they faced a tremendous and very sharp economic downturn. And Paul Johnson, the great British historian, praises Harding, says, well, the best handling we ever had because of the Treasury Secretary, Andrew Mellon, of an economic recession. Why? Because he let the business cycle take its course. That's exactly what Paul Volcker and Ronald well, Reagan did in 1982. How long did that recession last? 16 months. Mm -hmm. uh, and and, and it, followed by and the followed roaring by 20s. And followed by a huge boom. Grover Cleveland, great Democratic president, took enormous uh, grief because he became president the second time in 1893. And the country had this huge depression. And, and people believe that in terms of unemployment and suffering, it rivaled the Great Depression, may have been worse. And yet Cleveland refused to have this new government spending and these big new government programs allow the business cycle to take its course. And it ended up being a very brief uh, economic downturn that was followed by dramatic prosperity in the late 1890s and early 1900s. So we have a history here of... Uh, of business cycles. And, mm -hmm. and the business cycles that have been least damaging to the country have been those where the government didn't overreact. There, there's all kinds of reason to believe that, that all of these depression programs, and, and by the way, and Roosevelt was pretty clear about what he was about. I, I was stunned to actually read the words of his first ah, inaugural well, address. I've got those. I, I happen to have written those down because they are really striking. Here is, uh, we all know the famous, we have nothing to fear but the fear itself line. The only thing we have to fear oh, is yes. fear itself, right? Well, we and all know that fun. line. But these are, these are some more of the sentences from the address that you've picked out and that I was stunned to read. If we are to go forward, we must move as a trained and loyal army, willing to sacrifice for the good of a common discipline. Because without such discipline, no progress is made, no leadership becomes effective. And so on. Then that's later you know, on, want to say, imagine people saying Zeke Heil. Yeah, I mean that's, <laughs> and uh, 
And here's one where it sounds as if he, he, he could almost be Paul Pot. Hand in hand with this, we must frankly recognize the overabundance in our industrial centers, and by engaging on a national scale in a redistribution, endeavor to provide a better use of the land for those best fitted for the land. It almost sounds like he intended to empty out the cities and send people to the countryside. Well, it, it, at one point they, they were <clears throat> thinking about that in the New Deal, but this was in his inaugural address in 1933. And, and what it conjures up is the image of, of people with bayonets sort of uh, forcing uh, people into the countryside. It's, it's a bizarre concept. And, and see, that was part of the thinking of the New Deal. And the one thing that scares me about the, the oncoming Obama presidency is that Rahm Emanuel, who I've, I've praised his election as the new White House Chief of Staff. However, he said something to the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal that sounded pretty much like Roosevelt where he said, uh, you know, it's a, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. We don't want to waste the opportunity of this crisis. It is very clear that what Roosevelt did was to use the crisis of the Great Depression to expand his notion of a just government right. rather than to actually cure the crisis itself. I hope Obama doesn't make the same mistake. Now, the, one of the things that Roosevelt did was he installed something called the Works Progress Administration and um, people may be surprised to learn that it was fairly coercive. Um, that, you know, for example, there were codes for different professions. And uh, there was a tailor's code that said you could only charge 30 cents to press a pair of pants. No, that was the National and, Recovery Administration. Oh, sorry, the National, yeah. the, that's right. The Nas which which was declared unconstitutional right. by the Supreme Court. And, and, the and Roosevelt's response to that was? Oh, and now we're going to appoint 15 justices instead of just nine. Yeah. And they, they, they attacked the nine old men. And... It was one of Roosevelt's relatively rare defeats. I mean, thank God he was defeated on that one. It isn't surprising, is it, looking back, that there were that conservatives at the time regarded him as a as a tyrant, or at least a potential tyrant. Well, and, and somebody who was trying to to in a very very deep way change the United States of America, but it was all based on this lie, which has taken root since Roosevelt's death. Yes. Roosevelt was a compelling figure. He's a fascinating figure. I. I I, even as somebody who recognized the damage that I believe he did to my country, I still find him compelling to read about yeah. because his story is so remarkable. Mm -hmm. However, we cannot accept this lie that somehow government programs are the only way to, to go forward, the only way to, to deal with economic downturns or with poverty. In the book, Mona, and I know you've had the same experience, I, I speak sometimes uh, when I still get invited to, to Jewish groups, because I'm active in the Jewish community. And it's astonishing to me the sentimentality that a lot of these, these Jewish groups have about the New Deal and Roosevelt mm -hmm. and labor unions and social yeah. agitation. And so I'll say, okay, let's have a show of hands. Uh, for most of us, our parents or grandparents made it from the working class or from poverty into the middle class. How many people here um, made it into the middle class through government programs? There's no hands. No hands. Uh, zero hands. Then how many people here made it into the middle class because of labor unions? Maybe one or two hands. How many people here made it into the middle class because of business? Small business, big business, getting it. And it's everybody. Right. And, and you see, that it seems to me is appropriate for, for Americans to recognize. Is that the, the real gift for American progress, and this is true for Jews, it's true for Italians, Irish, it's true for African Americans. Well, the Irish, the reputation there is that they got jobs in government, and they, they became cops and city workers and so on, that they, they did get, uh, get ahead through government. Well, pro prominently involved in politics. Michael Barone makes this point in his work. However, by and large, if you want to talk about the, 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 the general success, People in this country have not succeeded based upon governmental reliance. And most people who've tried to rely on government have, have not been successful with it. I, I talk in the book about the, the free lunch program, yeah. which was started under Truman. Yeah. Under Truman. And we, we now feed 62% of all American school children in public schools get free breakfast, lunch, or both. And has Having been in these schools, I can tell you that the kids <laughs> don't eat it. They throw it away. <laughs> and, Huge and, mounds of and trash. And it doesn't improve their academic performance. I and mean, not only that, the poor suffer from obesity now. Right. So, uh, again, we have and, a program to feed starving children, and our problem with children is that they're too fat. 
It, the, the, but see, it it's, goes to this whole idea of good intentions do not ensure good results. It is much more assured when it was private charity. Mm -hmm. And what's so fascinating is we used to have feeding programs that were privately administered. We still do in America. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and they work so much better than doing everything through Washington, D.C. They work better because? They work better because you can make a distinction between what people used to call, and I write about this in the book, the deserving poor, Mm -hmm. And uh, the and, and the, the, what people call the distin uh, distinction between poverty and uh, penury mm -hmm. between between people who are poor because of behavioral choices and people who are poor because of temporary circumstance. And Mobility still exists. The exist person in who was giving the charity could make a decision about which person needed a kick in the pants versus which person needed just help to get through a bad time. Well, that's exactly right. And, and, and again, part of any meaningful anti-poverty program has to be not just handing people money or building people housing projects. Boy, that worked out well, didn't yeah. it? Uh, the <laughs> projects, yeah. Um, and no, it, it, it didn't. And you see, this is, again, one of the, the big lies. I can't believe that I lived through the so-called great society, being much older than you. Oh, yeah, much. All right. <laughs> but um, the, the great society programs didn't work. I, uh, I have a little subheading in, in my book about the Job Corps mm -hmm. called the Lost Regiment in the War on Poverty because <laughs> the Job Corps is still going. We've now had three government programs that show it doesn't work. And in fact, for women in the Job Corps, which is the semi-military program where people go to camps and they learn skills supposedly and it's a federal program that costs billions of dollars. We spent 25 billion dollars on the, on the Job Corps and apparently for women who participate, it makes them less likely to win employment. It's insane. As Ronald Reagan said, we declared war on poverty and poverty won. Right, unfortunately, um, but uh, it's not the kind of victory we should accept. Right. Um, we also uh, learn in your book uh, that uh, the, you, we are wrongly accused, you say, of a history of imperialism. We are. Um, and. and the, the, again, one example of that would be if we were such an imperialist nation, why have we allowed Canada to continue to exist? I mean, we, we can make the beer ourselves and we can even raise our own hockey players if need be. <laughs> but, uh, no, it, but you see, the whole idea of this imperialist uh, charge against the United States is based upon a whole series of lies. And one of the lies is that America used to be an isolationist country. We were never an isolationist country. We mm -hmm. fought our first big foreign war in 1805 under against President the Jefferson pirates. against the Barbary pirates, against Islamic extremists. By the way, we may have to go out against Islamic pirates now. Yes. Uh, you talk about history repeating itself. But, but part of this, I, you know, Mona, I, I, um, on the radio show that I host every day, I get calls all the time, the people against the Iraq war, they say, well, this is the first time that America ever went to war where we weren't attacked. Excuse me, yeah. there's only once in American history where we went to war because we were attacked, which was World War II. Right. We didn't go to war uh, ag against the War of 1812, not the Mexican War, not the Civil War, uh, the, uh, not the Spanish-American War, World War I, Korea, Vietnam, none of them were we attacked, right. only World War II. Right. And the truth of the matter is that in most of these wars, there was not an imperial intention. We went there, we, we achieved what we needed to achieve for our own national interest and for the cause of, of freedom and liberty, and then we went home. Um, um, except in those instances where there were very strong pleas from, uh, for instance, the reason we still have troops in Japan and Korea and Germany is, is not because we're occupying those very powerful countries and successful countries. It's because the, those governments that were allied with us want us to be there. And I would defy people who believe that America is an imperialist power to find one country that has been closely involved with the United States, uh, which has suffered from it. We have blessed those countries we've been involved, even those countries that we've defeated in wars. There was a movie that was made in the 50s that was called The Mouse That Roared, about a little fictional country that invade, that attacks the United States because they want to lose a war to the United States. The because Duchy that's the way of Grand Fenwick? Exactly right, <laughs> yes. Peter Sellers, pretty that's good movie. That's a great movie. Um, but do, aren't you glossing over a little bit, though, the history of the Mexican-American War? I mean, that was a case where the slave 
owning states really wanted the land. They wanted more slave states. And uh, people in the North were against this war, but we went to war anyway. We took, took what we wanted from Mexico. But see, um, I, I mean, I make the point in the book, I know that there is, that, <clears throat> that is, um, this is an item of historical debate. I mean, I've, I've talked a lot about where there is no debate. This is one where there is historical debate. If you look at Texas, uh, when, when Texas became independent from Mexico, the population of Texas at the time was about 90% American. Yes. They spoke English, they yes. were American settlers. The Mexicans had made this terrible mistake of inviting American settlers to come in because they had this empty land, and they didn't realize, hmm, American settlers, they're not going to want to be part of Mexico. The, virtually all of the territory that, that we seized from uh, Mexico, or that eventually was awarded to us, and by the way, we paid for it. And we did pay for it. And we, at the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, uh, we could have just taken it. But the Mexicans would rather we hadn't taken it. Uh, they probably would today. But ag again, if you believe in self-determination of populations, if you follow the Wilson's 14 points and what today is international law, th there was a, a basis for, uh, for the, the American actions in the Mexican War, certainly regarding Texas and probably regarding um, all California and Arizona, New Mexico is more of a problem because there was a Mexican population there. Mm -hmm. um, in, uh, in discussing these uh, imperialist uh, adventures, you, you uh, found a, quote, a great quote, which I loved. It was from uh, one of the uh, officers in the Philippines who was attempting to uh, gin up a, um, uh, a rebellion and he said, damn the Americans, why don't they tyrannize us more? Right, this Manuel Quezon, who was, be, because the whole experience in the Philippines, and, and again, people don't know about this war, we lost as many people in the Philippines, in a country that was one-third the size of what we are now, we lost as many people in the Philippines as we have in Iraq. And it was a very costly war for How the United States. How long did it States. last? Well, we, 1898 to 1907. And so that was a very long war. It, it was, and... But the result of it was that the Philippines uh, established the first elected uh, parliament in Asia. Uh, and, and of course, the United States, uh, particularly after the Filipinos fought alongside us in World War II, gave full independence to the Philippines. And if, again, had we been an imperial power, uh, we would have behaved very differently. Th this notion, I ask people to do the Bedford Falls experiment regarding the charge of American uh, uh, imperialism is the Bedford Falls experiment relating, of course, to It's a Wonderful Life, everybody's favorite movie, which people watch this holiday season. And remember that George Bailey uh, sort of has a vision of what Bedford Falls would have been like had he never existed. Imagine what our world would be like had the United States never existed. And the only question would be, would we, the world be dominated by the tyranny of, of Nazism or communism or a combination of both. We, we've mm -hmm. saved the world repeatedly and, and we're called upon to do so again. Another example would be that, you know, the imperial powers tended to go abroad in search of natural resources. We certainly need oil. If we were an imperial power, why wouldn't we just march in and take the oil of Saudi Arabia and say, right. we, you know, we'd like to appropriate this? Or at least seize the oil of Iraq. I mean, all of the money from yes. that, that oil is going to try to to set up an Iraqi government. The, the, the point being, the, the most suffering that nations have done have been in those rare instances where the United States has failed in its foreign ventures, like Vietnam. Vietnam was hurt enormously more by the failure of the United States in that war, and more people died in Southeast Asia after the United States withdrew than in all the years that we were involved there trying to defend the independence of South Vietnam despite Anthony Lewis saying that the best thing that could happen to the region would be for the U.S. to withdraw. And that was followed by, of course, terrible, terrible bloodbath. Um, now, you, uh, you also say that there's a myth that the middle class is shrinking or not doing well. And, uh, you the middle class is your... shrinking, but it's shrinking because people are moving to the higher level of income, not the lower. Okay. And, and by the way, there's no, this, this again, no doubts about this. Take a look at the numbers from the Department of Commerce or the Census Bureau. It, it is true we have a shrinking middle class, but it's because what people call the upper class ha has gotten so huge. And I, I, in the book, um, I found this Drew Carey, uh, the comedian, did, did something for Reason Television. Uh, He's a libertarian. He is. But he went out to Lake Castaic in L.A. County and basically just 
started interviewing people who were there with their boats. You know, gardeners, comp, truck driver. Are we sure, though, that they weren't in debt buying those boats? They may well have been in debt. However, Which is a problem. However, the, the lifestyle of, of people in the American middle class, uh, and even at this time of, of, of severe economic downturn, we live in bigger houses, we have more cars. Poor people in the United States today, people who are in the legal poverty in terms of the amount of DVDs they have and TVs and cars, and the opportunities for their children to go to college, which is a huge change in the United States. How can people you, say... You, there are some who say you have to look at consumption rather than at income if you want to understand where, how people are doing in America, right? Well, that's, ex well, that's exactly the point. And, you, and you see there, the, the figures of income don't include, uh, for instance, government welfare programs mm -hmm. of various kinds. Mm -hmm. And they also don't include the fact that things are so much cheaper. I remember when I was in college, I, I was working for minimum wage while I was in college so I could make phone calls, long distance calls to my girlfriend. <laughs> and it was that kind of long distance call used to cost uh, hours of work time per minute of long distance. Right. And today, uh, the telephone, that aspect of our lives, the, the amount Actually, of... Actually, you can do it on the internet now for free. Yeah. And, and, or people who get cell phones and it's unlimited or right. you have unlimited. But all of this has changed. The, the percentage of our money that we spend for food, uh, people go out to eat more today and not because they are poorer or they're impoverished. We spend as much on eating out today as we do on medical care, which is just, <laughs> whoa, yeah. shocking. Yeah. So, so the, the notion that, that somehow the middle class, and again, I would ask people about the experience and, and, and perspective of their own families. I, I know that in my family, my wife and I have hugely more fortunate, privileged uh, lives than our parents and certainly our grandparents. And, and we, are, we are not atypical. It would be a very, very rare American indeed where you could, would ask someone, do you think you live a higher or a lower standard of living than your grandparents? And the, the idea of, uh, I think it's very, very, very hard pressed to find Americans who are lower. And even the um, lifestyle of people who are considered poor in America would have been considered middle class just a few years ago. Yeah, right? and, and by the way, and a lot of this has to do with the, the tremendous progress toward racial justice. We're not there yet, and no one can claim that we are. Mm -hmm. However, one of the remarkable figures about this wonderful country, which I love so passionately, and it's an amazing thing, Mona, 11% of incoming freshmen this September in the United States of America in four-year colleges. High school, oh, college. In four-year college, incoming freshmen, 11% African-American. 12.5% of the population, 11% of incoming college freshmen. That is phenomenal progress. Mm -hmm. And it's a tribute to the country, and it's a tribute to the African-American <laughs> community. Now, there, there are some people, even on the right, though, who don't completely agree about the state of the middle class. Oh, no, um, yeah, yeah, of um, course. The, uh, there's, a, there's an interesting new book out called... Um, uh, Grand New Party. Uh, and Ross Douthat and uh, Rihan Salam have discussed this bifurcation of American life, that, uh, that the, the last 20, 30 years have been very good to the people who have knowledge and the people who are well-educated and come from stable families, but that not, not so good for those who come from more disordered family lives. And that is a problem, isn't it? I mean, the fact that family structure in America has, has seemed to divide us it, it is a problem, and, and by the way, and I, th I, I like their book very much. I've, I've had uh, uh, Rihan on my, on my show uh, a couple of times to talk about mm -hmm. his ideas because I think they're substantive. And I think what I take away from their work is that the real problem is not poverty for people who are formerly middle class. It's insecurity. Mm -hmm. It's worrying how we are going to keep what we've achieved. In other words, if, if you look at the people who feel the greatest anxiety and uncertainty, there are people who right now, they have cars and they have homes, but they have, as, as you indicated, they have debt. And that, that problem of insecurity, particularly at a time of economic downturn where people's 401ks and their pensions... Or 201ks, are, as some people are calling it. <laughs> right. Yes, no, that, that is a real problem. And look, we have not... We have not in the United States repealed the business cycle. We have not sir, sol uh, solved every problem. 
But I, I think that, that intergenerationally, if you pull back uh, the, the ability of, of children in, in even some of those homes that are most menaced by the, the financial insecurity and job loss, the ability of, of those children to make it to college higher education, who would have thought, in, just in the 60s, a minority of Americans graduated from high school? And we are, we are now at a level where we're, going to, we're very close to a majority of Americans graduating from either a two-year or four-year college. That's phenomenal. But as Kay Heimowitz points out, um, it's, uh, it's much, much harder for the child of a kid who has just a mother at home or one parent to get to the point of being able to go to college than it is for, parents, uh, for a two-parent family. And uh, we really have a problem with family structure. No, we, we, we <coughs> clearly we do. But... You see, so much of this goes back to that, that idea um, of personal choice and personal accountability. Uh, because ultimately, I, I am not sure, and it's one of those things that I think conservatives are going to have to talk about, what it is that government can do to shore up family structure other than removing some of the burdens. We, we, we did, did make progress, and by the way, the last chapter of, of my book, the tenth big lie about America is that we're in irreversible moral decline that the family is, is uh, completely destroyed and has no future. That, that goes with this big lie, which I've been on to for years, of a 50% divorce rate. Right. We've never had a 50% no. divorce rate. We don't have it now. But um, one of the things that you saw is welfare reform, which we did in August of 1996. It's the most successful single governmental reform of our lifetime. And, and it, it, it had a very positive impact on family structure as well, because for the first time in a, in a very long time, the rate of out-of-wedlock birth, particularly uh, among uh, impoverished families and welfare-dependent families, began to go down, because we took away the incentives that government had previously given for out-of-wedlock birth. So we just have a minute left. What would be the biggest message that you want people to take away from your book? Pride and gratitude for living in this great country. I, I, I think particularly w what I want people to get from the book is that most Americans instinctively love this country. They feel very grateful that our grandparents or parents or whoever came here. But uh, they don't really have the information or the argument to, to deal with, with all of these lies that say America is guilty of genocide, America is guilty of slavery, America is guilty of economic oppression, America is guilty of imperialism. My book, The Ten Big Lies About America, is an attempt to arm people with the information and the argument they need to win those arguments.